Hi, I want to do a quick talk and talk really about my experiences in researching genetically modified food. And ultimately, um, let me give you my story, how I got to learning about genetically modified food. Well, last August or October, I think it was actually August, I watched a video called Vanishing of the Bees. And I was so taken back by it because I grew up in England with bees all around me. And it dawned on me that I hadn't seen any bees in Japan. None to speak of. But I wasn't really looking. So this spring, I decided to look. And I have literally hundreds of videos of me looking for bees in Japan. And pictures of bee-less flowers. There's tons and tons of flowers, millions of flowers, bee-less flowers. Trees, bee-less trees. So I started to wonder why. Why would the bees go? What would be causing the bee collapse? Because um, bees are important, right? They pollinate 70% of our food. There's over 20,000 species of bees and less than 1% of bees are social bees. And the only reason we know social bees are honey bees is because we use them for agriculture. So I thought to myself, if these bees are dying, then probably all the bees are dying. And not only that, if the bees are dying, probably the butterflies are dying and 80% of other beneficial insects that help agriculture, right? So obviously it's alarming. And the, the, what was really alarming is the bees are collapsing in some place at over 30% exponential rate. Exponential function is an unsustainable function. Even like a 5% growth per year ultimately is unsustainable in a finite planet. You can't have, it's kind of like having um, interest on interest, interest on interest, and trying to pay back that interest on interest. Imagine if our $20 trillion was interest on interest, right? We had to keep paying back the interest on top of the 20 It would be insane. So an exponential function of collapse of insects is very serious. So it dawned on me that um, there, was, there has to be a cause, right? Well... In searching for information on Japanese bees, I came across a chart an EPA, from EPA that, that basically tracks the bee collapse from the 1940s to 2008, right? And the graph is basically goes like this, right? And there's some, jig, some jags and stuff like that. A couple things made me wonder. Number one was why would... Why was it 1950s that started the bee collapse? Because in the 1940s, it was like after the war, we had this increase in beekeepers. And then from 1950s on down, it's just been a crash, right, for the last 60 years. Well, a couple of things that caught my attention. Number one was from 1978 to 1982, the bees actually is the only time in the history of data from beekeep, you know, from, for beekeepers in the United States that bees recovered. And... Uh, I asked myself, what was it that happened in the 1950s? Well, you know, 1950s is regarded as the birth of pesticides. Ha ha, you know. Pesticides were created by Monsanto and Deep DuPont and all these other, you know, Bayer, uh, uh, Bayer and all these other corporations as uh, chemical warfare. You know, DDT and Agent Orange, these are Monsanto inventions, I believe. And ultimately, after the war, they're like, well, what can we use these chemicals for? Well, we could use them for agriculture, killing insects. So that's when the whole birth of pesticides. And, and then basically by the 1960s, a woman called Nancy Carlson came about who wrote a book called Silent Spring. And she ultimately said, hello, wake up. If we do not stop, we're going to have a silent spring. We're going to kill everything. Because in her day, we were spraying DDT and birds were basically falling out of the sky. And it's interesting because, you know, the chemical industry and everyone and even the governor and all the politicians were like, no, 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 it's not DDT. The bee collapse, no, 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 it's not pesticides. You know, um, the fact that we have all these conditions and ailments, everything from, you know, allergy epidemic to um, um, a lot of these, uh, you know, problems with, um, uh, what is it called, uh, asthma, that's the word, I can never, allergy and asthma, asthma, asthma epidemic in youth, and, um, you know, we have AD, ADHD, we have falling um, um, IQs, you know, and ADHD, I said that already, dyslexia and all that stuff, 
So understand pesticides are neurotoxins. They're neurotoxins because you can't kill the earthworm. If you have any sort of chemical that ultimately targets the earthworm and kills the earthworm, you've killed farming. So the clever point is to, the best part to target is the, is the cognitive functions. And um, um, so, you know, what's happening, and the thing is, is, is bees and insects don't have any sort of detox gene. We drink a lot, we have a detox thing. So how, how did I get to GMOs? Well, two months ago, I kept hearing about GMOs, GMOs, and I really, you know, I was ignorant. I thought GMOs really was, hey, let's make a tastier tomato, or let's make, you know, something, a, a, a fruit that doesn't rot, you know, uh, ripen as quick, or stuff like that. I never, it really never dawned on me, to be honest, that basically all this corn, this, this basically, you know, millions of hectares worth of corn that we're now growing, especially now for biofuels and everything else, that um, that ultimately we're dumping highly toxic Roundup um, herbicide on it. It's highly toxic. It's non-biodegradable. It kills plants by absorbing into the roots and, and basically sequestering nutrients and everything else, but it absorbs into plants, plants in which we eat. So when you spray it on corn or rice or anything else, you're ultimately spraying it into your food. And that food is ultimately being consumed either by livestock or by humans and ultimately affecting us. It's that simple. It's poison. The other, um, what really grabbed my attention first was this thing called BT pesticide. They have added a gene of an organism that creates this, basically this neurotoxin that is, you know, very good at attacking and, and harming anything that eats it or, or interacts with it. It's in the pollen. So if a bee interacts with a plant with BT pesticides, he's getting it and bringing it back. It's in the sap or the nectar. It's in every part of the plant. And the, and the scary thing too, it's in the fruit that you eat or in the food that you eat, if whatever it is that's been sprayed, which has this, which have become um, GMO. Now understand, 70% of the crops from my research are Roundup ready. And understand, as the market exponential growth of corn and soybeans, because they're both core ingredients and both of them are core um, GMO crops grows, so is the amount of these chemicals and pollutants that we're putting into the earth. You know, every um, uh, BT plant, right, ultimately creates more pesticide than if we were to spray it itself. Something else, they'll say, oh, we use less pesticide. Yeah, we use less pesticide, but ultimately the plant or an organism generates a lot more. And the other thing that's really scary about this is that ultimately um, this content is getting into our water. Now, do you understand that there's only 2% of the water on this planet is drinkable? 2%, that's it, just 2%. And we're putting all these agrochemicals into our environment and basically polluting that water. EPA tests, and you can look this up on Wikipedia under water pollution, right? Basically states that 90% of the water they tested, even rainwater, contained pesticides in it. 90%. So what's happening is these chemicals are not being extracted from, you know, the natural way of organic extraction as it filters through the earth. It's getting to the aquifers and everything else, and it's basically poisoning, poisoning the water that bees need and insects need. They need them for drinking, for feeding their young, and for cooling the hive in case of bees. So ultimately, if you poison the water and they create pesticides in the water, and you have insects that don't have a, a detox gene, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to kill the insect, it's going to weaken the insect um, to a point, or in su subsequent generations, if you're feeding this to you know, little, little baby insects, right, grubs, it's going to harm them. So over time, you're going to have this collapse. And the other thing, the scary thing about insects is we're only following the bees, right? There's 80% beneficial insects that we're not really... Who's, who's following these other insects? right? Bees are important for agriculture, but there's 20,000 plus other species of bees that we don't use for agriculture, right? However, they pollinate just as well as, or some, some of them even better. So it's really, really scary, right? And um, the, the one thing I was mentioning on that graph from the EPA, the one thing I noticed was in the 1970s, 78 to 82, the graph picked up. And I was like, why would it pick up? 
Now, the common explanation, and then afterwards in 82, it just crashes. And they say, well, 82, this crash in 82 is because of Varola Mites. Well, guess what? Varola Mites didn't hit the United States in the late 80s. All right? What happened in 82? What happened in 78? Well, I said to myself, well, who was president? And what was going on with the administration? Well, as I mentioned before, Nancy Carlson basically brought about the environmental movement. And as a result of the environmental movement, by the 1970s, it was so strong that the EPA was basically so pro environment for the only time in its existence was super pro environment and um, Carter passed the most stringent pesticide reg regulation in the history of humanity right since the birth of pesticides there's never been laws more stringent than Carter's um, you know um, and ultimately because of these laws bees started to recover look at that the data is right there because of the way we, we, we you know we said we clamped down on pesticide use and everything else well, what happened was Reagan came along, he fired 24 EPA directors, 24 directors, right, to clean house. And also we know Reagan, birth of the lobbyists, this when basically corporations took over. Lobbyists, interest, special interest groups in D.C., that's the birth of the lobbyist, right? And it all went downhill, and bees crashed at something like 40% rate those those four years and then kind of tapered off as I guess I don't know maybe they got rid of DDT I think that's what they got rid of maybe I don't know when DDT was finally cut off but um, but that's basically my story in a year and you know I went I've been trying to keep bees have not really success um, at that and I'm becoming an uh, organic farmer as all as you can see I'm in my classroom here I've got an hour I teach at a kindergarten. Um, so the scary thing about this, you know, this genetically modified food is also this trans, you know, uh, transgenic, which means the gene that we put into this food can move from one to another. Um, bear, a bear has something called Liberty Rice, which somehow got out and contaminated, you know, most of the U.S. rice. It's still an issue. Um, this contamination issue is used for regulation. Um, they went into Venezuela or one of the southern states and said, well, our rice or our corn is already here. You might as well pass it. Um, you know, Monsanto was even caught bribing in uh, 1998, was bribing uh, Health Canada. Offered them $2 million to pass bovine growth hormone. So if they're bribing Canada, you know they're bribing India, right? <laughs> that is the, the, the land of bribes. And South America and everything else. And when you're, you know, a billion dollar corporation with tons of money to the thing, you, you know, it's all about the, a few stakeholders. You know, and the other insidious thing is that there was a Harvard researcher, and I can't think of his name, I apologize, but he wrote something called Silent Spring, Silent Night, or his research is called Silent Spring, Silent Night. You can Google it. And, you know, he has shown that Roundup is not only is carcinogenic, but, but it's also chemical castra castrating those that interact with it. We're interacting with it. So is this the reason why we have so many fertility clinics? Is this the reason why we have so many miscarriages in the last 20 years? Is this the reason, you know, probably so, right? But you're dealing with a very complex issue and there's going to be no clear lines and, and trying to prove this is going to be extremely difficult. However, what we can do is look at a country like Japan that doesn't have GMO crops, has GMO labeling, and, um, and compare the health of the nation, the health of the students, the health of the, you know, with Americans. We don't have the ADHD epidemic as we do in America. We don't have the allergy epidemic as we do in America. We don't have the cancer epidemic as we do in America. Well, we do have some sort of stomach cancer, right? but it's not it's nowhere near. We don't have the cancer rates as we do in the West. The bottom line, and, and, and Japanese smoke a lot, right? So, you know, the bottom line is I believe we have the data. It's called 20 years of free GMO Japan and 20 years of GMO America. We've got one set of people who have been interacted with GMOs where 70% of their food is from GMOs. We have another group of people who eat very healthy who has no GMOs. And the data is right there. It's pretty clean cut. So I would urge you to 
become um, active in this. And I'm calling people in California, you know, and telling them to vote yes for 37, Proposition 37. You know, if it passes, if we can beat the 40 plus, 42, 45 million dollars that Monsanto and its cronies have thrown at this, then it would send a couple messages. Number one, it would send that no longer your dirty money is going to approve, you know, policies that are detrimental to the humanity. GMO that produces toxic or allows for toxicity onto food is detrimental. There's no way to cut it. The, the, the damages to individuals by putting poison on cannot be measured by the positive of feeding the world, which it isn't, right? There's no taste addition. There's no benefits to it. So if we win the war in, in California, then basically we say your money, you know, throw your money at a cause like this. doesn't matter. You know, you'll lose. Number two is we're winning the first battle against Monsanto, and to me, that's massive. If we can win this, we're beating Monsanto's money. We're beating a billion-dollar corporation. And we're saying that the people have a voice and we can bring it about. To me, this is more important than the presidential elections. You know, Obama lied to the people. I like Obama, but he turned out to be a piece of shit, just like every other president, unfortunately. I think the only decent president we ever had was Jimmy Carter. I really do. You know... And the only reason why is that, damn, he had the bees recover. And the only time in the history of modern presidents, he's the only president that had the bees recover. And to me, that's pretty damn amazing that his policies had a positive impact on the environment. And um, I was hoping that Obama would have been another Jimmy Carter who would tackle complex problems. He didn't. He basically shelled the complex problems, appointed a former Monsanto BP as the health czar of America. And, uh, you know, it's very disappointing. So what we can do as individuals, screw presidents. I'm not voting for any president. You know what? But I will vote for propositions. I will vote for things that make sense. And I, if I mean calling California from Japan to do so, I'll do that. Um, so it's, it's that important. Why is Monsanto, why are these companies putting so much money against it, right? It's these big agrochemicals. And the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, one of the arguments is, well, it doesn't cover milk, it doesn't cover meats and everything else. Well, you know how much money we would have against us if we pissed off the dairy association and the meat associations? You know, we'd have $200 million fighting us instead of $40 million. You think we can win against $200 million? No. So, you know, this bill is very much targeted this, you know, just the agrochemicals. We didn't want to bite off more than we can chew. This is a battle unto itself, right? So why doesn't it cover all these different things? Well, because we would have all this additional money levied against us and we, we basically, you know, would definitely lose. We're right now, you know, nearly 10 to 1. 10 to 1. $10 to $1 nearly, right? Um... Um, maybe it's three to one. I don't know. It's 40 million to 7 million or it's 43 to seven. So 47 to seven. I don't. So, um, it wouldn't, it's not 10 to one. My math is horrible. It's like five to one. So anyway, so the opportunity is for us to unite. Going back to my question, why is one cent against it? Because when GMO labeling passed in Europe, they lost money. So in their mind, we can spend the $40 million now, right, and our partners, and beat this and keep our profits, or we cannot do it and lose our profits. It's, they don't care about you. They don't care about Americans. They care about a few stakeholders. So help me send a message. Call Californian voters and say, please vote. This Sunday, it's a, if it's Sunday, get up in your church and tell your, cons your, con uh, con um, your constituency, whatever, your, your, I can't even the word, um, to support yes on 37. It's that simple.